Hello, this is Trudy Goodwin, also known as June Ackland, and you are listening to The Bill Podcast. Thank you so much, Trudy. One icon introduces another as we reach the third and final part of this Bill Podcast trilogy with the mighty Graham Cole OBE. This time we chat about Graham's autobiography, playing monsters in Doctor Who and lots more. Now you picked up all this knowledge while you were making the bill had a fantastic relationship with the police. Were you ever attempted to write an episode? Oh yeah, yeah. They would let us. Oh really? But in the early days, Roger Leach, oh. uh, Sergeant Penn, great character, Lo- lovely, lovely man, and Larry Dan. Yes. Sergeant Peters wrote scripts. And I think John Isles oh, did he? Uh, right. submitted a couple as well. But certainly Roger and Larry had a writing company. But it's a bit like, I always just asked if I could direct some and they would never let me. Yeah. I wonder if it's the same thing about casting directors and producers because they don't actually do what we do. Mm. And they just do the one thing, if you know what I mean. Think we can't do anything else. Whereas, you know, we're, we're probably... In a, I always loved working with female directors yeah, because they're not looking for all the butch bits they're looking for the subtle little bits and like Pat Sands hated all the car shots right you know I'd see her at sort of she'd be come out and the car would to wave us off in our half seven in the morning just then I'll see you when you get back sure you would like to come and watch and she'd just go <laughs> <laughs> do this prissy little face at me and, <laughs> and then go off but you know it's sad that they wouldn't let us do because if we're inside the camera a bit like I was saying I created, when they brought in the wonderful John Woodvine to play him, oh, yeah. that dad in my head, almost from 1986, yeah. in my notes at home, I decided my dad was a regimental sergeant major. So he and his sister grew up going around the world, never having real schoolmates, because every few months we were off somewhere else, which is why the, he hasn't got any mates, why he is sort of self-sufficient, but not totally. Mm. and why he was always pristine. I used to drive the wardrobe department mad about my shoes and all that stuff, stuff being yeah. absent, because he's come from that. And when they brought that John Woodvine thing out, hopefully between the lines, you could see Stan was always trying to impress his dad, and he never could. Mm. And John Woodvine, please, played him fantastic. And played a very similar character in Doc Martin. You played yeah. Martin Jones' dad in that. Again. Really think he, played heavy, he played heavies, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and on stage, I don't know if you ever saw him, no, with I've the Shakespeare's and stuff. Name. Powerful man. Yeah. And I was so, they were actually looking at um, Fox, played the dad and the foxes, and they were actually looking at him oh, first. Oh, oh, Peter Vaughan. Peter Vaughan, thank yeah. you. And they were actually um, looking at him first, but he, he didn't feel he was, he lived in Scotland, I think, oh, but he was well man. enough yeah, to come and play him, but that would have been. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, those castings do change. Uh, you asked me about famous people. Kira Knightley, does she ever write? No. I think no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Brian Murphy, who in the bill would go, oh, let's do this. Yeah. Let's make him. Santa's little helper and we do it for real yeah but the bill being the bill filled that set with snow real mm. snow four snow machines we had out there wow must have cost thousands <laughs> thousands of pounds Brian Murphy I saw him a little while ago played it beautifully Molly Sutton oh yes of course cool. played the wife of Ron Moody Ron Moody you're really testing my yeah. brain here, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah you're doing yeah. amazing <laughs> <laughs> and he was great uh, I think I mentioned uh, in the book there, he, I shared, I told him, he was in a, we have a big collecting sort of room for the female and male actors, and I just said to him, no, please, I'm, I'm out of the studio most of the time, you know, so use my, and he went on the beanbag that I had, oh. never set he had a beanbag, and left me this wonderful note, which just said, you know, I, I will not be lying, thank you very much for your use of your dressing room, I will not be lying on your anti-gravity device, no. so apparently got stuck there for yeah. about 20 minutes until someone could come and pull him off, but that was great, filming with him, Croydon Market was mad and he, and he went in you know when everyone got around him started chatting he couldn't help it oh, you are the big book you know he couldn't help it no <laughs> just couldn't. but that was amazing and, and so many wonderful wonderful guest artists we go back to Old Malarkey well, Barry yeah. Davis who directed that were in the tiniest flat the thing that Bill worked was all location cost fortunes but it was all yeah. location money. He knew we were going to be locked in this bathroom bit. And so we looked at the, all the crew came in with all the bits and pieces. We were literally going to be there for like four days or something. Yeah. And Barry Dave was looking around. Said, oh, right, we're going to have to be here then. And he said, I'll be a critic at the same time. So he sat on the toilet <laughs> <laughs> and directed us. 
was I directed this one there. But she was amazing. Yeah, and fantastic. Was amazing. Yeah. Was great, great role. And again, that whole bit about running into the bars and all that stuff. Yeah. Was just inspirational yeah. And, uh, and not wanting to get on the radio. Yeah, and this call is anybody. it. Yeah. yeah it was so beautiful writing. And speaking of writing, we've talked briefly about your autobiography. I mean, what was that process like? And you know, I loved it. Yeah. The two that came and asked me to do it, I was a bit reluctant, to be honest. But they said, look, all the best autobiographies are written for their kids. Uh, okay. Because there is a, an area before they were born where they didn't know anything about it, they'd heard about it and stuff. Yeah. And it becomes very cathartic. But like this interview, my brain goes all over the place. And there's some interviews where you just like you just shut up and just answer the question because I will go flying off on one. I adore my time on the bill, I will talk about it endlessly to anybody who will listen. And the book I thought would just be an indication of what the journey is actually like because everybody if I won an award people will go overnight success mm. that will be what the journalists will write somewhere well what about the 47 years yeah, of yeah. getting here and what used to really annoy me about the bill is that our publicity department come and ask you to do bits and pieces and said, but they never ask us about our families mm. our wives and our kids because when you think about all of us I think it was 52 kids were born or something in the period of our time oh, wow. together on that show none of us ever appeared in any of the magazines because we weren't drunks we weren't drug no. addicts our marriages weren't breaking up I mean you know Trudy Mark we've all, all happily the married. same partners same yeah. kids you know all roughly the same ages and all that sort of stuff some of our kids more successful <laughs> than others <laughs> Trudy <laughs> yeah. um, but um, you know they would never print anything like that but they come and ask you know um, would you like to do something about pants and like, no no no. no, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I was I, I was tie wearer of the year once, and I think I came fourteenth or something in rear of the year or something. Hey. But you kind of go, you don't look good in blue serge with all that <laughs> rubbish that we had to carry around our shoulders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The book it was amazing to write. Um, my kids and um, Cherry, and certainly my sister Jill, said it wasn't really like that. I said, yeah, but that's how I remember. Really yeah, and that's the interesting thing about our lives is that we will remember from the angle that we were at and dear Nuala Giblin who was publicity on the bill for a long, long time put it into book form for me but there were bits and pieces in there about Jeff and, and about Kevin and stuff and I didn't know how I could write it and not mention it because it was so big part of my life yeah. but again I know Kev's family because obviously I know two of the kids really well and they had a real tough time you know and, and everyone saw him as this loving character you know but he left them absolutely penniless you know he'd spent everything on, on the boozing and uh, it's one of those things that we, we try and tell particularly young actors you don't need booze and you certainly don't need drugs no. because of the youngsters I've worked with and alas many of them have gone the same route is that once you enter that the producing team can't employ you because they can't trust you the next day you're going to mm. turn up and it's all going to and it's all about money and timing and stuff. And if you go into drugs, the biggest problem you'll have is you start to believe that's what's given you the edge. Yeah. And then you dare not to take it. But of course, whether it's theatre and you've got the build up to theatre, you know, what, what I'm heading towards is an orchestra building up, then you'll hear the kids all coming in and, and it builds up and builds up and builds up. And I'm always first on as, as the baddie, you know. And that's great. And then you try to, as soon as you walk out, the adrenaline yeah, right. is unbelievable. Yeah. You don't need anything no. on top of that uh, because your body's got to cope with it. Mm. Um, and you try and explain in, in the book, but it does flit around as this interview. Yeah. I hope you haven't got to try and edit no, it's it. It's a pleasure. <laughs> this is great. But. but it flits about all over the place. And Nula said that, Jim, I'm going to try and keep that element in because it's you. It's like you're talking yeah. uh, to the reader. It's a strange thing because most biographies, in my understanding, certainly politicians and stuff, it's always written by somebody, mm. as opposed to you know, and that is actually yeah, that's my words. Your and, words. And I wrote it down longhand, yeah. and I still got that at home. Oh, cool! Uh, you know, and then and then the photographs and and the team, you know, it costs you fortunes. You know, I might play Tony Stamp, but his image belongs right. to Thames Television, yeah. so every photo with him in it you pay for. Right. And um, to get stuff back 
uh, that you're going to print, you know, with Vincent Price and Peter Cushing and Latin and Longer with us and things. But to get those photos in, you have to ask their estates. So and it's a huge uh, undertaking. Mm. But you need those pictures, you know. And I was saying to Cherry, do you mind putting, you know, the wedding in? Because no one's ever seen that, you know, that's, that's us. Yes. And before really anybody knew or cared about me, apart from her. Uh, and, and again with the kids, you know, how much do you tell them? Yeah. Uh, about your life and, you know, exactly where you live and, and things like that. And it can get very, very difficult. Mm. And the chair was all saying when we were looking for homes, I wish I hadn't gone with the police. Because I remember getting, you know, ba don't back onto parks, don't go on corners, don't go on uh, where there's footpaths. I mean, there's all those stuff, purely because you're, you're well known. Yeah. And if some nutter decided there's nothing they can do about it. Mm. So they can't move them on because it's a public right away and all that sort of stuff and the harassment laws are very difficult as you've heard mm. and are hearing very difficult and we used to have a team who come into us at the wheel mainly for the girls just to protect them so you know try and not get too friendly when you're replying uh, yeah and, go, I mean, I, and i still i did four yes i four last week i've done five this week sending in fact i did some photos for you and i left them in the office sorry oh I that was four you. women oh. um of old of stamp uh, it's old pictures but I always kind of write a few lines saying that someone bothers no one's just gone to Virginia USA ah. you know, posted it off this morning well where's the strangest place I know the answer from a book but where's the strangest place you've ever been recognised are you asking about the Australian yes story? <laughs> I was really disappointed with that I love Australia we've been there many times on the back of the bill and uh, I used to talk to the guys who used to work um, in the hotels and my, my gig was uh, maybe two or three after dinner in, in a week. And we'd have a lovely penthouse suite and the kids would have a car and they'd come off doing things while I was doing all the interviews and things during the day. And it was a lovely, lovely thing. And then we said, you know, where to go? And they got this one lovely little sugar cane train which takes you up into the mountains. So we went off and did that. And we walked out, it's a little bit for tourism. Like there's a bit of a plane and things there, you know, like it crash landed and what have you. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we walked in there and it's all run by Aborigines, which is lovely. And we went into this little cafe and we sat down and started having a look at these Abbey burgers, <laughs> and, um, kangaroo bits and all that sort of stuff that you get on there. And uh, then this guy came over and sort of gonna take the order and he looked at me, stamp. <laughs> and like the whole, oh, yeah. Here we are in the middle of nothingness in your country, and I want to talk to you about the didgeridoos. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was amazing. And he's, I, I won't remember which way round it is now, so it's a long time ago, but it is in the book. You know, his cat was Reg, and his budget yeah. was a Burnside, or the other way around. <laughs> but it was extraordinary, yeah, to go that far. And, and it goes, you know, and we, we've got the generator, the generator's all set up, and we've got the, the disc. It's all set up, and he said, and I'm watching this, and I'm shouting, I'm like, go left! <laughs> <laughs> this kid that's out trying to get the, the best signal, that is, is extraordinary. But I think, you know, I always take it as a huge compliment. Quite right, too. Anyone really recognises you, or, and particularly now, you know, although I do little bits and pieces and a lot, lot of theatre, but you expect people to be at the stage door and all that sort of stuff yeah. when you come out. And that, that's lovely, and there's some... Ladies talking about me on Facebook at the moment about coming up to Wolverhampton and all that sort of oh, stuff, really? you know. And uh, and I usually Facebook a little bit. I don't yeah. tweet too much. So I run out of characters. Oh, really? On tweets. <laughs> I, I can't believe that. But, uh, <laughs> and I can't be bothered to do it twice. You know, do two, two or three links. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's normally Facebook. And uh, and I did one year. I was playing Abenars, which is a great part. I think I was at Norwich or somewhere. And uh, I got this little Facebook message. Oh, we're thinking we're going to come and see you next Tuesday. So, oh, let me know when you're in. It was like say anything. And so I'm sitting down there and I go, yeah, we're, um, we're in the cafe and we're going to come and see the matinee. Like, oh, OK, great. Well, I know, you were all dressed in pink. How many of you are there? About 14? Or no way. Or something? Wow. I said, oh, well, just for you. So I was looking like this at the time. So I took some pictures and then I did each stage of, of his makeup. I took oh. another picture and I kept pumping it out to them. Oh, cool. And then said, I'll see you. Because I didn't come on as Abenaz for, for quite a chunk of time. I'll see you in about you know, 15 minutes or something like that. When I went out, this whole row of <laughs> pink, oh, pink clad magic. ladies. But that's what it's about, isn't it? I mean, that's, yeah. That's crazy. I, I don't know what it's like to be a super superstar. Well, that you've got another something. fan base in, in Doctor Who. You know, there's yeah. not many people who get to have two legendary series on their CV mm. and two have played. Yeah, one, one where they see your face and the other one you're encased in rubber. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Continually. Yeah. Well, it's a shame because nowadays, like the. <laughs> 
I don't know why the Dalek operators got away with getting a credit and like you know yeah. Cybermen and Melkers you know yeah. I mean he's well, I think do you know I think part of it was because we were like the BBC players like I mentioned others so we'd get a phone call and you'd go in and, and the casting department they were fantastic do loads of tests for new directors new shows oh. uh, you know you'd go in and try for the generation game and I was Bruce, with Bruce Forsyth and stuff <laughs> playing games to see whether they worked or not oh wow um, with him loads of agents uh, Jeff and I used to do top of the pops shifting the crowds around yeah. because they had cameras and we were getting shot so they had to employ actors oh. so we'd have to move them so they didn't get smacked on the head you know by various cranes and stuff that were whizzing about there so there were lots of those little jobs and they'd bring us in for and the Doctor Who's as came I'm very patient mm. and I could sit around and you know I'd do a load of hypnosis stuff I mean it's, it's in the book and stuff and I'd do you know, to, just to calm my own nerves and stuff and learn how to get rid of all the the nonsense of this business and not get carried away with it at all and um, they asked me to do this and I met Amy Roberts who was one of the designers and, you know, and, and if you're in on the first like we were with the bill if you're in on the first of it like cameramen would come to me and say you know Chaz go, I've made this I think it might work and they want to try and stick the camera on the front of the car but it's something he's made in his garage over the weekend wow. you know and then you I mean, it's, it's beautiful to be part of that and it was the same with those guys when we played the Cybermen first off we had to be so precise with our guns because someone had to draw. Draw around them, yeah, of course. <laughs> the yeah, the fire, you know, shock, or whatever, yeah. you know, and yeah. all that stuff. So you had to be very precise and they needed to employ actors. And one or two guys, you're in moon boots, full body, gloves on. Last thing that went on, and those of us that were speaking had mics and little ear pieces. Uh, others didn't. And then the helmet went on and it was held with four posi screws at the back. Oh, so you knew once in. you're in it, you've screwed, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and, and some of the guys did, after a while, panic well, inside yeah. there. We got a little bit of mesh uh, where the mouth is, which could flip up and like, shove a straw through so you could get some water in and things. Right. But then you didn't want to take on too much water because you couldn't have a pee anyway. Oh. But it was just talking to them, you know, and they're sort of like, well, what are Cybermen, you know? And being first off, I thought we were really scary and I thought the more they used CGI the less scary mm, mm. Uh, they became and one of the things I would always say to people even Marshmen and stuff like that I would say you know you've got actors inside we're still acting yeah you can't actually see us but um, my daughter would always say I always know which Marshman you are because you use your hands mm. uh, okay. yeah. the great stories there with Black Park we're out and all this and we're in full they were based on diving suits which they stuck latex rubber on to give it that scaly skin and then the helmet went on afterwards and of course in the studio it's baking hot when we went out to shoot in Black Park and the lake there um, it's a different concept altogether you know and um, the director's getting all upset because they can't get the dry ice to stay where they want it to stay and all that sort of thing <laughs> but we're going okay well we're going to use six of you okay if you want six of you go into the water and then come out menacingly <laughs> so we all sort of paddle in and then go as deep as we can go and on the given note we all go down well of course they said count to ten well of course six people count to ten at different times <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, uh, people love it when I tell this story, so I show a uh, little bit of pictures on, on the screen behind me. The first time, all you saw was like six bums, <laughs> because the diving suits are filled with air, <laughs> which of course we weren't aware of, because no. we thought we were down under the water. Yeah. They then gave us stage weights to oh, take right. in, because we put the stage weights down. When we waded back in, could we find them? <laughs> I mean, it was just like... But that appeals to my sense. Oh, inside there... Yeah. laughing my head off yeah you know walk menacingly and like I mean to, to tell you the truth we went to act into the rehearsing studios and uh, they marked out on the floor you know taping where sort of cave holes and walls and things will be and I'm walking behind Tom Baker in jeans and a t-shirt and he's in sort of similar stuff but the director just shouts me make a noise like a marshman <laughs> give me something to play to <laughs> marshman <laughs> yeah. so I'm sort of going <laughs> Behind him, you think this is a living? <laughs> Explain this to your kids when you yeah. get home. But that's it's fascinating. That yeah. stuff is fascinating and creating. And when it goes out, a Melker, of course, was just one. Again, it was Amy yeah. Roberts designing, and uh, she came up with this idea. And uh, it's going to be against the TARDIS. You know, it's going to be the yeah. Master's time machine. Yeah. And it was one of again. I've got earpieces and mics and stuff, and you learn so much about the pressures of directors and all that. You've got yeah. this earpiece in your ear, and I'm sitting there. And, Shouting at people, you know, and how the ASMs. If you tell that effing actor, if he effing does that again, I'm going to come down and rip his effing bits off. And then the little ASM, 
the director wondered. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's all in your ear, you know, carrying oh. on in your ear. So I mean, it's, it's amazing to do it. But then to go to the BBC uh, to work with their technicians, how they're going to do it, we're going to do Blast from Paris and all that sort of stuff, and then yeah. build him slowly up. And of course, it was for me, and I was close on seven foot tall. Wow. Uh, once we were in the boots and, and all the rest of it, and uh, it was fabulous to do, and his burning eyes and all that yeah. sort of stuff, you know. And we tried it several different ways with cables and things, but it's hard to hide cables. And they tried to do it with a, a battery in his bum. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but then he was going to turn it on and off. Yeah. I mean, it was just yeah. like... But all that stuff. But I, I kind of just used to sit there and just chuckle away when I was listening to the gallery you know, yeah. and all saying to each other. And so, well, very funny. hopefully they will reward you with a role in the new Doctor Who at some stage. Well, you know? I, was, I was interesting to see, and I th- I th- one of the stampers, I think, put online that uh, Bradley Walsh, his character's called Graham, and there's somebody else called Cole. And in the press bit, it's got Graham Cole. says, oh, I see you've made it. <laughs> oh, right. So Bradley, well, yeah, why couldn't I be? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a bit younger than I am, but, you know. Well, you work with Bradley in Law and Order UK, a lovely, lovely part, a yeah. nice property and I know, business. I know him as well when we were um, done the charity stuff, and I've known him for 20 years, 20, 30 years. Yeah. It's interesting to do it's just I, you know, I think sometimes it's who your management are if your management are in with sort mm. of the new guys coming through that did you know Peter Kay all those guys I work with all of, all of those guys and uh, I guess I don't even might follow Harry Hill yeah you know, Harry used me loads and loads of yeah time. that's right I haven't heard from him for a while but I hope you know you're always yeah a little grey matter at the back of his head and, uh, but I, I like the, I like the different stuff I like mm. pushed and tested and, and I like the audiences to maybe see you know different different aspects of what you do and who you are, you know. I'm learning here how great you are with voices, but it's also the singing voice as well mm. that you've got up your sleeve. You know, you've got a lot of uh, tricks to your trade. Yeah, I, I do wish I'd sat with Dad. My dad was a great pianist and organist, oh. and I wish I'd sat with. I was always out playing sport. I wish I'd sat with him and, and learned to play the piano and stuff. It would be so good now for him just to sit down and do that and. Certain things, funnily enough, I was at a funeral, of which I'm attending far too many mm. nowadays, uh, with a guy who used to run a youth club from the church that we uh, used to go to, and uh, Graham Allen, one or two other mates were there, and um, Bert used to teach us the guitar and stuff, another instrument I can't play, but I played the drums and that stuff. But Graham and I were just recounting, playing these songs, you know, and I said, do you realise you were the first person I sang Streets of London to, and I've sung it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times since. And it's normally because I do this little chat about uh, when I was in the health service, we used to go around London to the down and outs and we were just checking to make sure they hadn't got uh, too many really bad illnesses and things, you know, but we'd be handing out soup and, and stuff and I'd chat to people and I chatted to this lady for months and months and months. Filthy, smelt awful, but mm. her hair was always immaculate. And after a while, I got to hear when we were in, uh, under Charing Cross and one night uh, that she came from the aristocracy and she had a baby out of wedlock and that was it, booted out from home. And I always say to people, you know, there's thing when you see people down and outs in the street, maybe the story's not quite what yeah. you think it might be. And then I go into Sing the Streets of London, and it brings a whole new poignancy to that song. And uh, even when I was in Australia once, I was doing this lunchtime chat show, and I'm so grateful coming out of Variety. And I'm sat in there, and this guy, he's a bit abrasive, you know, a bit clever. You know, you sometimes meet these presenters and all that sort of stuff. Like, he obviously didn't want me to talk to somebody from the bill or whatever it was in his head. And then he said, oh, I understand, you sing a bit. And these curtains opened, there was a little trio behind. And I gave him full belt of the streets of London. So that shut him up. Yeah, that right. <laughs> Good on What you. would you like to sing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's those moments where, um, where it's very special. Um, that just came in my head with Mark Wingett when we were doing this uh, Durbridge play. It's very wordy Durbridge plays. <laughs> it was all right. But we had 72 hours to put it together. It was pretty tough. Wow. But uh, wonderful actors around us. And we've got this piece, but I'm playing the inspector, and there's a lovely Mark Curry. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've got this speak of about two and a half pages about aircraft landing, aircraft taking off, koala bears, necklaces, fake necklaces, real necklaces. I mean, it went on and on and on and on and on. During rehearsals, Alan, who was directing us, always said, I would skip that bit. (laughs) I never really got to rehearse it, to be honest. (laughs) But I was doing this one, uh, one Wednesday matinee, and I started doing this bit about koala bears and things, and... Do you perform? I used to, yeah. When that I cold shudder went down my spine, where it's like, oh, what is it? What line is it? Oh, no. And I've been there many, many times before in my career, as it happens to all actors before. And I look at the two, uh, Carol and him, and they can't help me, you know. And Mark said he was with Mark Curry 
and they're up the dressing room talking. Did he just say that? Because I'd stayed in absolute character. And you've got the audiences before you. No one can help. No. I haven't got an ASM yell the line at me. And I just stayed in character and looked at the audiences. If I could remember my next line, I'd deliver it. And that's all it took. It was like 100 percent I go, ah, oh, I know what it is. And then I was back on. Yeah, it just yeah, gave yeah. me that breathing space to go back on. Yeah. But it's that kind of variety bit. But whether uh, you know, the, the artist amongst me, and certainly Ken Wright, whether he was pleased about it. <laughs> yeah. He hasn't said anything to me. Even afterwards, he put his arms around me when we finished it. Think, oh, we really must do this again. Oh. But it's just those moments where you just go, like, what can you do? You know? yeah. The ASM, when they shout lines at you, it, it very often doesn't mean anything. No. Have you just got time for another story? Yeah. You know, I've done many, many musicals. And I was doing pilot in Jesus Christ Superstar. And you have to run to a scaffolding set, you probably know. And as you run upstairs and get to the top, you're level with the gods. So it's an unusual place for, for an actor to be. And as I run up the stairs, I'm about to do the abolishment. Second centurion knight from the left plops a tablet in my hands and there's a bowl of water. So when I plunge my hand into water, it turns red as he sings, I wash my hands of your indiscretion moment. Right. And as I run upstairs and I go past it, he misses my hand and I hear it go, ding, 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 oh, ding down no. the stairs. And I turn at the top and you've got <laughs> 2,000 people, I don't know how many in there. And I look and I see it coming up the stairs, the back of everyone, like Mary Magdalene, yeah. <laughs> the disciples <laughs> and the Romans, and they're all working in unison and they're bringing it back up to me. And it hits my hand and I look and what the hell is the line? <laughs> And I looked down in the pit and Martin Yates is on the 22-piece orchestra on a bell note. And he looks up and he goes, when you're ready, son. Oh, no. <laughs> that's why we do it. Yeah. I mean, the words came and we were away. <laughs> but, but, but I think that's why people come yeah. to live theatre. Yeah. You know, we dig a hole. Yeah. How do we get out? Same Shakespeare's and stuff. You know, we all hate doing school Shakespeare because well, the kids are studying it. Yeah. So they're virtually mouthing it yeah. at you. Uh, but half the time, as we can get away with the audience, don't know what we're supposed to be saying anyway. So <laughs> yeah. um, that's why I think Mark and all those you know, did yeah. you say that. Did you say that? <laughs> well, you've given your time so generously today. I've got you some biscuits and chocolates. They're yours, by the way, to take away. Am I a hero? Yes, you are a hero. But but, but was <laughs> it's the, the there's a box of heroes for, here, yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. But for was, Christmas, there was some thoughts gone into the choice of the chocolate. Uh, oh, that's true. And you know my love of biscuits, obviously. Yes. Biscuits and cakes. Did some, did some research, yeah, so yeah. I'm pleased. But what I always ask people who are listening to this for free to do is to donate to a charity of the interviewee's choice. Now, obviously, you have earned an OBE, which we haven't even talked about, for <laughs> all your charitable work, which is, you know, congratulations Bless for you. doing yeah, that. And you. amazing Very for proud. your mm. ongoing work. Mm. If, if there's one that... Uh, the listeners of this can support right now at the moment. Which, which one would you like? I would still say Childline. Right. Uh, purely, I've been there a long time, and we're anonymous, so we don't get the big sponsors mm. because we can't show you a spreadsheet. Right. All we can tell you is 4,000 ring them every day. We've got 12 switching centres around the country, and I'm still moved when I hear the stories and I meet uh, a lot of uh, the kids uh, later on in life. And... If I could just leave you with the thought that if you're on the line and you're one of our counsellors and the child you're talking to is anonymous, we aren't going to interfere unless they're in danger. We've got the NSPCC to back us if we think there's that situation. But normally it would go over quite a number of phone calls where we gain their trust and, uh, and they'll ask us uh, what they should do. You know, do you know a parent? Do you know someone you, a school teacher, someone who, mm. who you trust? And if it's a sexual, uh, it's much bigger and, and we'll take our time with it. The worst thing you hear online when they say to you, they're on the stairs now, what do I do? That's why I ask you to support Childline. Quite right too. There will be so many, many, many people. I mean, you've got a fantastic fan base. And I thank each one. Yeah. Very special to me. Yes. And... Good luck with the editing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think this is going to be a free part, (laughs) which is great. Sorry. You've got the first trilogy, quite right too. Sorry, sorry. It's a a thrill. Thank you. This is amazing. What's your message to people who continue to support you? I mean, yes, the bill was brilliantly written and you had a fantastic character, but you brought him to life for all that time. And uh, I mean, you write about it so beautifully in the book how you felt when you left. The show finished when you were gone. You were the heart of the bill. You still are the heart of the bill. And that's why people 
will be absolutely thrilled to listen to this today and why I'm so honoured to be with you today. Thank um, for that, that's very kind. What is your message to fans, like my good self, all over the world who follow your work? Keep following. <laughs> yeah. um, and wherever I am, I, as I say, I, I do a lot of theatre. Um, my greatest thrill is, is meeting fans and when they tell me that they're in. Uh, I've got a fellow that's uh, bringing his handicapped son uh, to see the show and we do special shows as well uh, for, for handicapped and Asperger type. Um, it's a heightened show so we're aware that they're in and, and we'll do the things for them. We won't let the flashes go off, there won't be any loud bangs and all that oh, sort of sure stuff so right. we do a, a tailored show uh, for those kids. So um, it's vital to us um, when people when I hear actors say I never look at myself on television but how do you know whether you're doing a good job or not theatre is very difficult because we have to trust in our instincts and then the, the public will let you know as I say I get a panto the kids will let me know whether it's worked yeah. or not uh, which is very special fan base is so unusual and it grows with you and you learn to appreciate what people are saying and doing I, I, I don't go on Facebook and Twitter all the time I, I, I try and get on there as, as much as I can but it, it's, I love reading the messages and I do read all, all of the messages it's so unique to artists um, and if you're a big big star they probably have teams of researchers and, mm. and people that you know. I still send out still read all the letters and still uh, reply to the letters and still send out the pictures because uh, I'm not that huge. Um, but every letter, every tweet, every Facebook, everyone who cares, was it 23 members, I think, you know, Glenn Quigley is yeah. it's extraordinary. I just sent him a huge thank you uh, card for all the stuff because he finds clips and things that I've forgotten <laughs> long about. Uh, and he's wonderful and he's very technical, which I'm not. And to him, you know, and, and, and Stampers, that's extraordinary. And I go and I talk all over the country. So I said I was doing a gig uh, two nights ago in the city uh, with big sponsors about uh, children coming out of care and things, you know. And I, and I'm, and I talk about stampers and stuff like that. And, and they love those those stories, you know, that out there somewhere, you know, around the world. I'll, I'll tweet about stuff or Facebook about stuff, and around the world will reply. Yeah. And and I I inaugurate that in, in the shows that I do, in the speeches that I do. Um, I, I'll read one or two of them out, you know, and uh, say what it's like, the experiences I had playing him mm. uh, with the public was extraordinary. Our location managers would say wherever we went, they'd go, is, is Tony coming? Um, you know, and I love the teams that I work with, you know, and the actors that I work with, and Trudy and Mark and Eric created the show and made the show. I'm just so grateful that Tony Stamp was taken to people's hearts. And a bit like we've explained, I don't question it. I, I don't want to analyse it. i just so grateful that it's there and when they're in and they're watching me live I love it I went to a, a mate's funeral uh, this week and uh, his widow said oh we came to see you in Cambridge when you were doing Robin Hood and why didn't you tell me you were in you know, yeah. we didn't want to bother you oh. but you know that's what it's when family and friends and you know true fans yeah. let you know they're there it's special and, and when we were doing with Lovely Die uh, it's very special to you that people come up and say oh, I'm so and so oh okay might take me a few minutes to, to yeah. work out who that is but it comes together I remember when I was doing White Christmas at the Dominion Theatre Ala Jones and I would have a stand up arguments 2,000 people in the Dominion and I'd say to him you know half of these are my fans <laughs> no they're not they've come to see me said, no they haven't mate. you might be Welsh and a singer they haven't come to see you <laughs> and we went off and we did carols in Trafalgar Square and then on the way back as the crowds were all dispersing about every 10 feet I was stopped and he disappeared. And then in the wings that night, as uh, we were about to, I was playing General Waverley. Uh, and he's never on, in, in the wings at this point, so he doesn't come on until after a bit. But uh, he came up behind me and he said, I surrender. Yeah. <laughs> you surrender to the stamp. <laughs> about the nice full it circle is. at Christmas. What, to a finish of white at Christmas yeah. and uh, have Less fun sure. in Wolverhampton. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on your podcast, mate. They're very special. Oh, well, Bless well, you. It's only it's, it's to celebrate special people like you. So thank you so much for taking part. Graham, Bless all over you. Thank you. What 
what an absolute legend and such a lovely man. I am so, so grateful to Graham for so generously giving his time and sharing his memories and sharing the good word of the podcast on Twitter and Facebook. I'm really grateful to him. This is what this whole podcast is about is celebrating all our favourite TV heroes. So thanks again to Graham Cole OBE, whose nominated charity is Childline, which he described far more eloquently and personally than I could. So please visit childline.org.uk to make a donation or get involved. And perhaps as this has been a three-part special, those of you who might not have donated to any of the podcast interviewees' charities to date, this could be a good one to start with. So childline.org.uk Now if you fancy meeting Graham, then you have the chance, courtesy of Phantom Films' Back to the Beat convention, uh, which takes place on Saturday, March the 17th at the St Michael's Centre in Chiswick, West London. Also announced, as well as Graham attending, are Eric Richard, Mark Wingett and Chris Simmons. Tickets start from £25 and you can read more at phantomevents.co.uk. And on that note, I've actually started receiving quite a few messages from fans of the bill asking me if I can organise personal meetings for them to meet the cast of the bill. Just to clarify that I'm in absolutely no position to do that and would never dream of doing so either. Uh, I know most of you listening to this will know this, but that's not the way things are done. Uh, All the actors have agents who handle fan mail or personal appearance requests so do it properly get in touch via the actors agents if you want an autograph or you know the chances of actually just turning up and meeting the actors unless you happen to pass by them in the street or if they are doing a theatre play and you want to wait outside afterwards with other people who've watched the show that's a way of getting an autograph but to be honest the best chance uh, we're guaranteed to meet your heroes and see them in action are events like the Phantom Films events or indeed the Misty Moon reunion events so check them out and um, you can meet your heroes that way Looking ahead to Series 2, the rest of 2018 I've been very lucky to chat to some of the finest actors to ever work on the bill and I've got 8 episodes edited at the time I record this which will be released every three weeks moving forward rather than monthly so there's less time to wait in between episodes and I'll be chatting to more legends later in the year I've got some new dates in the diary and I'll announce them probably in the spring in the meantime here's a selection of what's coming up in series two of the Bill Podcast I seem to remember this. They said something like, Proctor is wet behind the ears. He's just new into, into CID. So he's been in uniform for about a year or something like that. He's a new copper and he's going to get on the nerves of like old dinosaurs like Carver <laughs> yeah. and Lines and all this. And I thought, oh, good. Do you know what I mean? Like, this should be fun. I watched every performance that I was in. Didn't watch every episode, but everything I did... Because I always thought it would be like being a tennis player. I would always watch my game because I'd want to improve it. And there would, even toward the end, there would still be things, hmm, I might have done that a bit differently. I might have just put a bit more emphasis there. Or, you know, not critically, but just thinking, yeah, because I want to be on my game yeah. all the time. I want to be on my game. You know, I was the first woman up in the CID. I wanted my character to be really strong and to be taken, obviously, very seriously. And I didn't want anything else to get in the way. So it was about my life and my profession and how I'd progressed to get into the CID and how I played out 
within that sometimes very sort of male dominant world if you like so people didn't really need to know any more about me that was just as much as I felt that people needed to know Thank you.